text that I'm going to talk through is is the uh, the Pentecost narrative, uh, Acts chapter two, uh, verses one through twenty one. Um, I do want to start with just a time of devotion, just a time to allow us an opportunity to block out everything else that's going on in our day and just uh, focus on this moment. Uh, and one of the ways that I like to do that when I'm preparing to study and things like that is uh, to listen to a song or do some music. Um, and I did want to share a song with you this morning uh, that I was listening to earlier today and really spoke to me. And I think it ties in uh, with the message of Pentecost as well. So I want to share that with you. Uh, listen along, use it as a moment to clear your head and focus on uh, the task at hand, and then we'll come back together uh, and go through the text. So let me share my screen here with you. Uh, this is a song, it's a relatively new song from Chris Tomlin. Uh, most of you are familiar with Chris Tomlin that he did with um, uh, a band that's one of my favorite bands, Need to Breathe. Um, and it's a song called Power. So this is the lyric video. So uh, feel free to, to watch and, and use this as a time of devotion. <sighs> Will you pray with me? A gracious and loving God, we give you thanks today of, of all days as we prepare for this Pentecost Sunday coming up, a day where you revealed your power to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for that spirit in our lives. We give you thanks that your Holy Spirit has formed the life of your people from the very beginning, uh, and we still have access to the power of that spirit even today. So we pray that that spirit be in this room, that as we talk about that day when your spirit blew like a violent wind and landed on each and every one of your disciples and everyone heard the message of the gospel in their own language, that you would reveal how to share that to our congregations even today. And so we pray that you guide us and give us your wisdom and your spirit during this time. And in all things, we give thanks to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I, I, I will say I had to laugh a little bit at the auto-generated um, closed captionings because apparently when you sing Jesus, it comes up as cheese. So it just said cheese a couple times in the middle of the song. So I thought that was uh, kind of funny. Um, but like I said, uh, today our passage is going to be uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, uh, which is one of the lectionary passages for uh, Pentecost Sunday. To be honest with you, I've never preached from any of the other ones on Pentecost Sunday uh, because it's the story that we need to hear. And, and, and there are other good things in the other ones, um, but I think it's important for us to tell the story of this foundational uh, event in the life of the church uh, when we come to Pentecost Sunday. Um, just to give you a little idea of how I want to approach this, uh, my thought was to approach it the way that I would approach preparing for a sermon on Sunday uh, on a text and to kind of walk you through what my process would be and to invite you to share parts of your process as well. I think the difficulty of this is that we all have our own styles. We all have our own way of approaching the text and uh, our own way of doing things uh, and, and even different contexts that we're serving in ministry of what the people need to hear and, and how we can say it. Um, but um, basically the way that I would approach this text or really approach any text that I want to preach on on a Sunday um, I essentially ask four questions that I want to uh, walk us through. And the questions, and we'll, we'll deal with each one of these individually, um, the questions that I have are, what's the text saying to me? Or what is the text saying devotionally? And I always start there because to me, it's important to feel moved by what I'm reading or else my preaching is not going to be effective. If I don't connect to it, if it's not something that is speaking to me, it's gonna be a real hard sell for me to, to share that with the congregation as well. Um, so that's usually where I start. So I'll start through uh, just by reading the text, uh, reading it a couple different times. Uh, sometimes or most of the time, I'll read through different versions of the text um, and different translations to kind of see if there's something different that stands out or say, okay, why did this translation use this word where this one used this one? Um, and sometimes it's just interesting, especially with a story like Pentecost that we've probably heard so many times, to hear it said in the message versus the NRSV or the NIV sometimes changes our perspective on things or makes it come alive in a new way. 
Uh, so that's usually how I start. So that's what I want to start with uh, today, just reading the text and seeing what jumps out at the text to me. Are there particular words? Are there particular themes or ideas that are presented there that really just stand out to me when I read through it? So I'm going to read from the NRSV uh, today. Um, <clears throat> I do, um, like I said, I, I would normally read this from different uh, translations. I don't want to sit here and read the same passage to you multiple times, um, but I uh, do want to share that with you. So if you just want to listen along with me, um, and then we can discuss a little bit about things that stand out to you, things that stand out to me, uh, and we can move forward from there. So this is what the text says. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rushing of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And, as the sound, and at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed these men, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you would suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, declares God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky, smoky mist. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I wanted to, to get some, some feedback from you before I, I talk a little bit about what stood out for me and what my next steps would be. As you're approaching this text today, if you're using it for your Sunday sermon or just part of your preparation, um, what are the things that really jump out to you when you read through it that um, make you make you pause and think maybe I should look into that a little bit more. Does anyone have anything as they they read through it this morning or I guess it's this afternoon um, uh, that they want to share uh, at this point? All right, you guys are, are a talkative bunch. <laughs> I can never seem to get past that that final verse. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah. And um, you know, this week I'm kind of wrestling with like that's really great news for us that like, yeah, even we can be saved, but it also makes us question, okay, who are we keeping out? Um, who are you know we withholding that salvation from, even though they're calling on the name of the Lord? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I always um, spend a lot of time with in this text is, uh, you know, so many different people from so many different places, yet there was someone who heard and understood everyone in whatever their tongue is. Uh, and I do a lot of wrestling with that. Um, um, as I look at our world and society, um, those who are not heard, those who are not understood, uh, yet we serve this God 
who gives us this clear example um, that through God's spirit, you know, um, everyone can be heard in their native tongue. Uh, and, and so I always like to spend a lot of time with that, especially, especially being very introverted, a very introverted person. Uh, um, I always just, just rest in that for a while. I've always been fascinated with the description of the tongues of fire coming on the disciples. Um, yeah, that was a, a big focus when I went through confirmation, but unfortunately, the way they did it, I was only 10 years old at the time. So reconnecting to that aspect of growing in your faith to, to reach like discipleship level was uh, always something that stayed with me. Anybody else? For me, I, I resonate with a number of the things that have already been said as far as the everyone who calls on the name of the Lord or every nation under heaven. Um, I see that word every come up a lot here, uh, at least in the NRSV version, some other versions um, say it a little bit differently. Um, one of the things that stood out to me this year that, that doesn't always stand out to me um, was just the different reactions that people had to the spirits. Um, and reading through the, the descriptor words are bewildered, amazed, astonished, um, that they were perplexed and amazed and things like that. I even looked up bewildered in the dictionary and it came back as dazed and confused um, and was thinking about how we uh, how we perceive the spirit as it falls on us that um, that we have different reactions and just listening to those those descriptor words I think was a real interesting thing um, but yeah it's a really dramatic scene it, it's it's suddenly from heaven it says there's a sound of rushing like a violent wind and fill this entire home where they're sitting and I try to picture that and I have no idea what that would look like or what that experience must have been like, but it must have been startling to them, even though they kind of knew it was coming. Jesus talked about it before he was ascended into heaven and said that go and wait and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and then you can go do these other things. But it's interesting. And what was funny was I was thinking about this this week as I was looking for a song to share and what I noticed was that in a lot of the songs that we sing, at least in contemporary songs, um, we talk about inviting the Holy Spirit or uh, the one that came up a lot was, you know, the song that says, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Um, and when I read through this, uh, my reaction to that was, I don't think the Holy Spirit cares if it's welcome or not, it's going to show up. Um, that it's not like they're waiting for it and they're like, yes, Holy Spirit come. It says, no, the Holy Spirit comes in there violently and uh, suddenly from heaven. Um, so I, I thought that that was interesting that a lot of the times that we, we talk about the Holy Spirit in personal ways, um, in ways that we're welcoming the Holy Spirit into our lives, but that's not really how the Holy Spirit tends to show up, at least not uh, in this section of Acts or really in a lot of other places when uh, when God's spirit makes itself known. Um, so usually what I do is, is, is as I move on from the devotional aspect of this is to really start to do my research of what is this passage saying contextually or what is it saying to the audience that was originally reading this or hearing these words for the first time. So that's where I would go into some of my historical research and literary research and theological research and looking at the text with some commentaries and things like that. Um, and there's a couple interesting things that I think uh, come out of this passage that, um, that you can get from looking at that instead of just reading the text. Um, and one of the things that whenever I use a scripture passage from Acts, I always go back to Acts chapter one, verse eight. Um, and one of the things that I remember learning when I had a class on Acts um, was that this is essentially the thesis statement of the book of Acts uh, or, or the story of, of Acts. 
and it's right before Jesus ascends. And he says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit or when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And if you look at that, and then you look at the rest of the story that's presented in Acts, it really follows that chronologically that they receive power from the Holy Spirit and then they're witnesses in Jerusalem and then they go to Judea and then they go to Samaria and then they go to the ends of the earth. And it ends with Paul essentially on a ship to go to Rome, the heart of the Roman Empire, which would be a place where they could really preach to the ends of the earth. And that was the center of the known, un the known universe at that time. Um, so I always kind of go back to that. And this is the beginning of that. And that's what I read in this text is that there's a new beginning that's happening here. There's this new foundational movement uh, in the formation of God's people here. Um, and I think you see that in some some language that's used or some imagery that's used that kind of brings them back to Mount Sinai. Uh, it's interesting that uh, as I was reading and, and reading about what the, the festival of Pentecost was, um, was essentially an, an, ag an agricultural festival where you would give your first fruits and, uh, and share thanks to God for that. Uh, but that it also transitioned to a point where it was also about celebrating the law given to Moses. Um, some of the commentaries that I read were, were sure to point out that we don't know if that's something that they, they scheduled or um, looked at at that time, if, if they had made that transition yet. Um, but you definitely see some parallels here between uh, the story in Exodus when um, Moses receives the law and some of the things that are presented here uh, when the spirit arrives in Acts. So you, th you have things like loud noises and fire and things like that. And that kind of shows us that just as the Sinai covenant constituted a foundational event for the people of Israel, you also have this foundational moment in the formation of the church. And we sometimes talk about this as the birthday of the church. I tend to not use that because it becomes cliche after a while, um, but it really is a beginning moment. It's a foundational moment where uh, the church really begins at this point and really starts to go out and fulfill the mission that was given to them first with Peter preaching here uh, and then everything else that happens throughout um, throughout the book of Acts and, and beyond. Um, I always I always pause in Acts 2 when Jesus says that, you know, we'll receive the Holy Spirit and we'll be able to do more than Jesus even did. You know, he says when we're promised of the Holy Spirit that, that we'll be able to do things that, we're, that are even more effective than Jesus's ministry. And that's always a cause for pause for me because it's, it's so dramatic there. Um, and it's, it's something that is, is, is important for us to think about that the power that we get from the Holy Spirit allows us to do uh, so many incredible things. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I re re was reading uh, this week was uh, looking at the passage from Joel. Um, and usually if a scripture quotes another scripture, I'll spend some time looking at that as well. Um, because that's essentially what Peter does is when he gives his sermon, he says, this is what happens. Uh, this, is what hap this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he shares, you know, in the last days it will be, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and daughters shall prophecy, young men, old men, uh, slaves, both male and female, all of those different things will prophecy and, and God will pour out a spirit and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord uh, will be saved. One of the things that's interesting here is that Peter doesn't quote Joel exactly um, and that he adds that introductory expression that we translate in the last days. Um, but that's not in Joel's text. Um, but Peter adds that to kind of highlight that we're entering this new era or this new phase or, you know, it, it's hard to talk about those things because it is a, a, a continuous way of looking at God's spirit in the world. But looking at this as a foundational moment, uh, but also that it's the beginning of this new uh, last days. And we hear that throughout the New Testament a lot. Um, but Peter uses that, or, or uh, the author of Luke and Acts shows us that, that that's an important thing to point out. Uh, but I think, as, as I think Greg uh, had said earlier, that this, this focus on 
the universalism of the Holy Spirit, that it's poured out on everyone, that it's not in the days of old where it was just certain prophets or certain people that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on to be able to prophecy or to be able to have visions or to be able to dream that uh, it's regardless of uh, gender or age or social status that it's pointed out here, but that the Holy Spirit is poured out on, as it says, all flesh. Um, that I think that that's one of those things that we really uh, focus on here. And that's such an important part of this passage is what does that mean to us? And where is where is the exclusion happening today, I think, as, as a couple of you had said earlier as well. Uh, and that kind of moves us into the contemporary part of things. Um, you know, as I would move forward from this uh, and doing my research and things like that, my next question would be, okay, what is this passage saying to us today uh, as a contemporary? What are the things that are going on um, in the world that... Um, that this passage can really speak to. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the story of Pentecost is there's a whole lot of different things that it can speak to. There's a lot going on here, which is great because it is that text that we use every year that, you know, I, I was even sitting down and I came up with, you know, seven or eight different topics that I could focus on, which is great because that gives me seven or eight years of sermons for Pentecost um, and probably more uh, that would come up in a different time that I would read it. Um, but some of the things that really stood out for me that uh, made me kind of pause and say, I need to think about these topics a little bit deeper um, are this whole idea of power uh, and like the song that I used at the beginning and, and, and what is referenced a number of times in the text uh, about being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that they're speaking in other languages about God's deeds of power. Um, what is our understanding of power? What is our understanding of how God's power is displayed in the world? And what does it mean to have the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives? Because a lot of the times we think about power in terms of force, right? We think about it either uh, in a physical sense of force and power, or we think about it in terms of bending other people's will to what we want them to do in sort of a very uh, direct and forceful way. Um, and sometimes we ascribe that to the Holy Spirit as well. And I guess in some cases, like I said, the Holy Spirit bursts into the room here suddenly uh, with the rush of a violent wind and it fills the whole house, uh, that that is a very sort of aggressive form of power. But how do we go about uh, our lives, understanding the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly as leaders in the church. What does it mean for the way that we exercise power? What does it mean for the ways that we interact with people in our own lives? Um, and this would be a point where in my own life, just knowing my personality, I would go off into um, doing some research in social sciences and how do we understand different forms of power? Uh, the ones that come to mind for me, uh, there's a, a model uh, that goes back even to the 50s and the 60s, uh, the French Raven model of power that talks about power in uh, five different bases and that we can exercise power in different ways. Uh, some are because of the position that we have or our ability to give rewards or punishment. Sometimes we get power because of the information that we have. Uh, sometimes we have power because of our expertise in something. Uh, sometimes we have power because somebody likes us or something like that, that there's uh, an attractiveness or a worthiness or a respect that's given from someone else. Uh, so when we think about the Holy Spirit giving us power, what is the language that we really wanna use that and if we're exploring that? Because if I'm going to give a sermon about power uh, from the Holy Spirit, I really wanna be careful that I'm defining that in a correct way, that I'm not using that as an excuse for disrupting people's lives or, you know, exercising some sort of authoritative position or something like that, that yes, the Holy Spirit does show up in those ways sometimes, um, but what are some other ways that the Holy Spirit shows up? Because even though it rushes in uh, to the disciples as they're sitting there, when Peter goes out and preaches, 
they they speak in the language of the people that are there listening to them. Um, and Peter explains it in a way that they would understand. And it says that, that this isn't part of the text for this week, but comes right after. And you're, you're probably all familiar with this, that it says 3,000 people came uh, and, and were baptized that day. And, and just the expansion of the church based on the power of the Holy Spirit here uh, is a pretty incredible thing to think about. I know I've never preached a sermon and all of a sudden 3,000 new people came to church. Um, so that is a pretty incredible thing if you think about it, uh, what happens in that moment. Um, so I would think about power comes to mind. Uh, the idea of unity comes up here a lot. And I'm not saying that because I would preach about that or if I did, I would be real careful about that um, because one of the things that comes up here and is sometimes presented in different commentaries or even just in people's knowledge about this is that, uh, and you probably heard this or, or maybe even said it yourself, I know I have at different points in my life where Pentecost is the reversal of the Tower of Babel, right? That, uh, that was a place where language fell apart and this is a place where everyone uh, kind of comes back together and seeing that as a, a form of unity um, but there's a lot of other commentaries that say that that's really not what's going on here. That's uh, kind of a generalization that, that we kind of read back into the text. Um, and it can be dangerous when we talk about unity. Um, do I think we need to talk about unity and what that means? Absolutely, because we live in a world that's very ununited <laughs> at this point. Um, but I think it's important that we're careful about if we're gonna talk about unity in the Holy Spirit, as it's presented here, that we talk about a unity that embraces difference and doesn't erase differences. Um, because I think it's a really important point to see that the disciples were speaking in languages that were not their own and were in the language of the people that were hearing them. You could read that, you know, the Holy Spirit could have acted in a different way and changed the people's ears so that they understood what the disciples were saying in their language, but that's not what happened, right? What happened is that the disciples were able to speak in these other languages and reach this great diversity of people who were there uh, that they go to great lengths in the text to say, this is everyone that we know. It's every nation under the sun. And then it lists all these different nations uh, which is always fun when you have lay readers uh, at church, when you give them a passage like this with a bunch of names of places there um, that are in there. But it's really done to show us that in all of the known world that they knew at the time, there's representatives that are here and they are hearing the message of the power or, or the deeds of power of God in their own language. Um, and that's something that they hadn't heard before. That's why they're amazed by it. That's why they're perplexed. And that's why they're asking, what does this mean? Uh, because they're hearing something that they've never heard before from this group of people who are all from the same location. It says, they're all Galileans. Why am I hearing this in my language when I'm from somewhere else and they don't speak my language normally? Um, so I think that if we're gonna talk about unity, we have to make sure we're talking about it from a place that allows for difference and embraces difference. You know, when we talk about unity in the life of the church, if we talk about unity in our cultures and in our society, it's not just a unity of, you know, let's put our differences aside and just agree to disagree. That's not what happens here. The, the unity that comes out of this, if you read through the rest of Acts is not an easy unity. And you see it come up over and over again because if you go back to that thesis statement of, you know, be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, that gets them in a lot of gray areas at times here as well, where they're, they're all Jews. They're all people who have heard it from a particular perspective, and now they have to go to these places that at different points in time, they thought were unclean. They didn't want to go to Samaria. They didn't want to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. They didn't want to talk to Cornelius and Peter having visions of all these things coming down that would be unclean to eat and having this vision where God says, what I have made clean, don't call unclean anymore and trying to live that out. And that's a difficult thing to come by. I mean, think about it. If your church did expand 3000 people from a variety of different backgrounds and cultures and languages overnight, we could say that at one hand, hallelujah, that's great. 
but imagine the administrative headache that would be to keep everyone together, right? That's why you have the institution of the deacons that happens as well here in Acts, because you have this great multitude of people from all these different backgrounds, and they want to make sure that nobody's left out or left behind or not getting what they need. And, and it's difficult and they don't always get it right. Um, you, he, you have Paul having to rebuke Peter where he says, you know, you'll sit with the, the, the Gentiles when no one else from Jerusalem's here. But as soon as they show up, um, you, you go and sit with, with other Jews and you don't do the same things. And, and, and Paul kind of calls him out there. Um, so when we talk about unity, we talk about power those are really big topics that we have to make sure we're doing them in the right way, particularly because the church has been notoriously not using them in the right way in the past, where issues of power, issues of unity have been used to exclude people or to um, keep people down or to take advantage of people or um, all of those different things that we know are in, in the life of the church uh, historically. You know, I did mention uh, another thing that, that came to mind for me was the different reactions to the Holy Spirit. Um, I'm sure that we could come up with ways that we react to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and when it shows up in ways that leave us dazed and confused or leave us amazed and perplexed and wondering. And I don't know how many times in my life that I've asked the question of what does this mean? Uh, that's something that I think a lot of people ask when the Holy Spirit shows up in their lives. So uh, that was another way of, of looking at things. Um, remembering our beginnings was another idea that came to mind that could be a topic for a sermon. Again, looking at this as a foundational moment in the life of the church and, and going back and really examining what that looks like. And again, this would tie in with, with power as well, that think about where our church came from and think about what it is now. It started with a group of you know, 12 disciples in a room, because uh, this is after they reinstitute a new disciple in uh, to take Judas's place, that they're in a room and the Holy Spirit comes in. And then that's where the church starts and they go and preach and, and share the gospel and people are added to their numbers every day. And think about this movement that's shaped the course of the world for better or worse throughout history from that time to today and beyond. Um, it's really incredible to think about where that comes from and their lack of traditional sources of power in that moment. They don't have uh, means to themselves. They don't have positional power. They don't have ways where they can reward people or to hurt people or have all the information. But there's this power that comes from the Holy Spirit that even amongst this small group of people is able to really explode and change the world. So I think it's it's really astonishing when we look back at the beginnings of the church uh, or, or the church movement here um, that, 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 that we can go back and look at. Um, I think as some of you had mentioned, you know, the idea of everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved um, is another topic of, of preaching and could be a great topic of conversation, uh, particularly in the context of the things that I've mentioned that happen uh, in Acts uh, past this point, um, because I think that's a question that gets asked a lot in Acts where they meet someone new, they meet a Samaritan, they meet the Ethiopian eunuch, they meet Cornelius, they meet these people and they're saying, okay, when we say everyone, do we really mean everyone or do we, can we not have this conversation, right? And God continues to put them in places, give them visions, uh, give them uh, opportunities to, to meet with people who are different than themselves. And the fact that even Paul is included in this when we have the conversion story uh, shows that, you know, even love your enemies because Paul was an enemy of the church and, and how the church had to react to that that says, this person who was putting our people to death is now saying he's one of us. And how do we accept that person as well? So there's a lot of that going on in Acts where the church is expanding and at every step of the way, there's this discomfort that you see coming through the text of what does that mean as we expand who everybody is, um, that every nation under heaven, okay, well, since that time and now, there's a lot more nations that we know about. There's a lot more people that we know about. 
when we talk about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, what does that mean? And, and how do we incorporate that into our preaching? Um, another one that kind of comes in here that I think it's, it's important to talk about too is nationalism, tribalism, those types of things and how this uh, is a way of combating that. Uh, and I think that that could be a really powerful sermon depending on your context and how that well that would be received. Um, or maybe that doesn't matter to you. Um, and, and just thinking about how we have this rise in nationalism or we have this rise in tribalism where we have this in-group, out-group distrust where if someone's different than me or speaks a different language than me or comes from a different place than me, um, then I view them in a different way than somebody in my own group uh, and how when we see every nation under heaven here and when we see God using this small group of people to speak in all of these different languages so that people can hear the words of God and the power of God is an answer, is sort of an antidote to, to our, uh, our, maybe our primal instincts to be insular and to go back to just the safety of having people around me who I know and who are like me. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to talk about, particularly in our day and age. That would be something that would be very on the nose for the things that we're experiencing in the world and uh, experiencing in our own communities and how we don't like people who are different than us sometimes or that if they, they are different or if they're not even, even if they're the same and they're not from the same place. I mean, I'm in Lebanon County and I've been here for seven years, but I'm still an outsider because I didn't grow up in Lebanon County, right? So it's one of those things where sometimes because you're from a different place, even if it's one county over, there's this sort of distrust that you're not one of us. And what does that mean? Because if we look at the text, it says everyone's one of us, right? Everyone's part of this group. And we have this great diversity in the church that's presented here. Um, and it's this great moment in the life of the church. <laughs> one of the things that, that really came to mind here um, for me that I had not thought about in the text before so maybe this is one of those things where the text didn't change, but our circumstances have changed. That at the beginning of the passage, you have this mention that they were all together in one place. Um, and that's what Jesus told them to do. He said, go and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Um, and just hearing those words in the context of where we're at now, where we've had a year where it's been really difficult for us to be all together in one place, right? Where I don't know about your churches, but that's a conversation that I have probably once a day. Uh, sometimes they're cordial conversations and sometimes they're not about being back together and having everyone back together and getting rid of these restrictions and all these things. And, you know, all of the different things that go along with that, the political conversations about what role the government plays and people bringing that into you in the church or just, what people are missing and being able to gather together for worship at different levels without restriction, that I think this could be a moment to, to point out or to remind people that that is not the end goal. The end goal isn't to be back together in the same room, that that is the beginning of this passage. But as soon as they receive the power of the Holy Spirit, they're told to go, that that's a beginning point, that's not an end point. Um, and I think, unfortunately, based on our circumstances, the narrative has changed to this is the end point, that I just want to be back. I want to be back with the same people. I want to be back in the sanctuary. I want to be back uh, and able to worship and see my friends and neighbors without a mask on and listening, lifting up our voices to God and all of those different kinds of things that that is what people's goal is. But as we move to more things like that, and as restrictions get lifted, it's important for us to also remind people that that is not the end goal, that that's what happens in Acts chapter two, verse one, and then they're not there anymore, right? Then they go out and they preach the gospel. Then they go out and they share the words and the works of the power of God to all these people, every nation under heaven, all these different languages, all these different cultural contexts, and they go out and they do it. So that's a beginning point, not an end point. 
Um, and I think that that's probably something that we could have always talked about because we know that people, once they get into church, they view that as the end goal, that, that our job is to get people into the pews and to tell them about Jesus so they can be saved. But getting into the church and getting into the pews is the beginning of their journey of discipleship and that they go out to the world and do things at that point and participate in the mission of the church. And I think that that's uh, an important thing that we could have always talked about, but I think particularly this year with the emphasis in so many conversations, at least in my context, about getting people back together and being together in one place uh, at a time when we haven't been able to gather in one place unless it's on a Zoom meeting. Um, so we're all on the same screen, I guess, but that's not one place. Um, that there's a reminder in there that that's the beginning, that's not the end goal. The goal is to be together so that we can go out into the world together and go out and to share uh, the mission and ministry of the gospel. And that's not just to kind of uh, come in this place. And, and there was um, a, a a line that was in one commentary that I read that said uh, that acts is reliant on the spirit's ability to set proclamation in motion. Um, and, I, and that just stuck with me for some reason about the idea of moving and doing mission and doing the work of God, that it's about putting words into action, essentially. Uh, and this is the moment where they've waited, they've done what Jesus told them to do, go and wait in this room until the Holy Spirit comes. And now the Holy Spirit's come and they can go out and do the work that he's given them to do, to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth to tell people of the power of God. Uh, and I think that that's just a really great, great thing that we get from this passage. So, you know, as I was reading through that, you know, I can see that there's a number of different things in there. Um, so my next step, if I was preaching, uh, would be to look at all these different things and different topics and saying, okay, what's the spirit and what's the text telling me to say this Sunday? So if I can come up with seven different sermons from this, what's my focus going to be? Am I going to talk about power and unity or uh, unity and diversity or um, how do we react to the spirit or what are the beginnings of the church or what does it mean to go out into the world and do mission and, and have this, you know, all of those different kinds of things that I just mentioned I can't talk about all of those on one Sunday because I'll be all over the place. So what's my focus going to be? Um, what's my message or what's God telling me to say this Sunday um, as I prepare and look at all the potential things? Okay, what works best for my congregation in this moment? What do they need to hear from this text as well? So that would kind of be my last question. And then I can say, okay, this is gonna be my topic. And then I would just work on writing my sermon from there. Um, there was a, a, a quote in, in one of the, and this is the last thing that I'll share. Uh, and then we can have some conversation as well. Uh, and this comes from, it's actually a pretty old commentary the the interpretation series of commentaries. Um, if you're familiar with them, I know that they have been pretty popular throughout the years. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a, an older one. Um, I think this one was copyrated in 1930 or 73. Um, and the Acts one is actually written by Will Williman, um, who many of us are familiar with in the United Methodist Church. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things he says here that I think is, is really interesting when we talk about Pentecost is, is this is what he says. <laughs> he says, to those in the church today who regard the spirit as an exotic phenomenon of mainly interior and purely personal significance, the story of the Spirit's descent at Pentecost offers a rebuke. Luke goes to great pains to insist that this outpouring of the Spirit is anything but interior. Everything is by wind and fire, loud talk, buzzing confusion, and public debate. The Spirit is the power which enables the church to go public with its good news, to attract a crowd, and, to, and as we shall see in the next section, and to have something to say worth hearing. A new wind is set loose upon the earth, provoking a storm of wrath and confusion for some, and a breath of hope, uh, a fresh breath of hope and empowerment for others. Pentecost is a phenomenon of mainly evangelistic significance, as the central question of the crowd makes clear. What must we do to be saved? Whereas the crowd who heard Jesus' sermon in Nazareth sneered, is this not Joseph's son? 
Luke is delighted to report that Peter's sermon inspired by the spirit produced enthusiastic converts. Now Jews from every other nation under heaven are coming to the good news. In these last days, as Luke 2, 32 predicted, true Israel is being restored as we shall learn later in Acts and shall be a light to all the nations. As the psalmist sang in Psalm 50 verse three, our God comes, he does not keep silence, before him in a devouring fire, round about him a mighty tempest. Um, and I just thought that that was really interesting as we listen to the ways that the spirit moves into our lives uh, and that it's not a personal thing. It's something that's done in community and it's something that's done to send us out into the world and to do the work of God in whatever our context is. Um, so I know I've talked a lot and I've probably rambled at certain points uh, as I normally do when I'm preparing to preach, uh, but I do want to take time to hear from you as well with, with our remaining time here of what are things that, that I didn't say that you would focus on or um, to pick up on things that I said or, or other ways that you would look at this text as, as you all prepare for uh, your sermons this Sunday. You have to get the first person, Dan, to talk. Oh, yeah. Who's who's gone with the Acts passage this week? Where are you headed? Jeanette, I saw you turn your camera on. Go ahead. <laughs> You're muted. I just read, I love Fred Craddock's stories, and I just read one of his stories about when he was a child and he um, traced a picture and gave it to the teacher and she was so impressed with his artwork she said why don't you do some artwork for the parents and then he had to confess that he traced it and then he ends with have you ever done that have you ever taken a piece of tracing paper laid it over acts two and thought it was your sermon <laughs> I just thought that was so good so I appreciate Dan all of you that you brought to this familiar text so that I don't just make Pentecost Sunday a, a traced sermon I love that illustration that that can preach too right because the spirit um, meets us in new ways in different ways and I, I really love Dan what you said about the spirit shows up whether we're ready or not uh, for the spirit to come who else where are you going six minutes Andrew go ahead DS Foster Dan, I, I appreciate um, who you are as a person and your, your ministry and your reflection. And I also appreciate your rambling because most <laughs> times I hear you more clearly when you're rambling. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's another, another conversation. Um, I'm not preaching from Acts uh, 2, 1 through 21 uh, this Sunday, typical passage of scripture. However, I'm preaching a memorial service for Olivet Brown on Pentecost Sunday. Wow. So when you're talking about um, she's in a cross was in a cross-cultural, cross-racial appointment. This to me is just so timely uh, that the congregation wants to have a memorial service of their cross-cultural, cross-racial pastor to be remembered. So I'm coming from Romans 8, 31, 39, but I will tie in, typically we, you would hear this passage of scripture. So the homework assignment is X, Y, Z for them to do that about Acts 2. Mm -hmm. So thank you for, for that reminder that it was a starting point for us to go and do ministry so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Lori, are you on the Acts passage? You're muted. Sorry. Um, I'm doing um, Acts and also touching on uh, the, the, uh, the gospel lesson. The, uh, my, um, sermon title is visions and dreams and fires oh my um and i'm, I'm i really want to touch on um uh, just the starting again you know as, as you said that we have a jumping off point here um and we're coming back and and so i want to uh, talk about the visions and dreams of what we see as the church and and the fires that we need to light that and um the fact that um we do it with with Jesus, even though he's he's absent, but um, and physically. But uh, I just I just want to really concentrate on that. I haven't 
put it together yet, but that really spoke to me about touching on what the visions and dreams are. Defining a vision is, you know, what, what are visions? Um, and, you know, what's the difference between a vision and a mission? I think there's some confusion there. And so I want to get that going too. And what is our vision as the church? And are we doing the things we need to do to, to bring that vision to fruition? So that's where I am still in, in the process. Yeah. Nice. And I, think, oh, yeah. And, yeah. and I think what's great about what you just said is that part of this is how do we make sure everyone's voice is heard in that vision? That how is everyone, because this vision includes everyone. So, so often when we do vision and mission and things like that, it's people in positions of power. But what about everyone? How are we making sure that everyone in our church, in our community has a way for their voice to be heard and be a part exactly. of Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. While we have Steve Morton here, Steve, what's your favorite Pentecost sermon? What what do you what do you relate with here? For preaching on Sunday, um, I think I have to touch on Jews and Arabs. Our world is a mess. I mean, we're watching you know something unfold that we you know we don't understand, and and uh, you know there's there's there's. Um, <laughs> There's, there's, there's just something profound in, in that language right now. <laughs> I really appreciate that, Steve. You know, what, what does it look like to preach this text in a world that is divided and is not, right? We don't listen to one another and um, is literally at war and on fire in some places right now. But I just so, think that one yeah. screams. I, I, I've gone through, you know, all of these, like like Dan said, nobody wants to read this God awful pack because I can't say, you know, these words, but, you, you know, do some extra Jesus on some of these nationalities and these cities and whatnot. When you look at what, what Paul a little bit later on says about Cretans, it's not very nice, you know, and, 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 and you can get people to laugh a little bit about that. I mean, that's the mixed bunch of characters uh, that, 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 are, that are listed here. And what's that? Yeah, what's that, what's that saying to us and about us? Right. Well, it's also yeah, that's good. because, you... yeah, that's um, Peter, the one who stands up with this confidence here, couple chapters later needs another vision from God to go and talk to Cornelius because he needs to be convinced again that what is unclean has been made clean. So it's not a once and done thing either. <laughs> Anyone else? We're at one minute till. I want to get, oh yeah, Judy, go ahead. Uh, Robert Worth now uh, from Princeton many years ago, now the late Robert Worth now, uh, wrote a book, Christianity in the 21st century. He wrote it in the 20th century. And this is, this is the crux of the book. We gather to scatter. Yeah, perfect. That's great. That's great. And that's a great, that could be your title. Um, well, I want to thank uh, Reverend Dan Lebo for his time, his presence, his words. We did videotape today. Last week we didn't, so we will have this on file. Um, and I want to welcome next week Reverend Eric Carr, who's going to be leading with us. You heard from Reverend Carr today earlier, and he'll be hanging out with us next week to lead us. So look forward to welcoming you back then um, and have a blessed afternoon. Enjoy this beautiful day. So take care, friends. God bless you. Bye. Great. Bye. Thanks, Dan.